For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mudli. Author Mbusu Nkosi joins me today to discuss his book, These Potatoes Look Like Humans, The Contested Future of Land, Home and Death in South Africa. Mbusu, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Sashni. Your book offers an understanding of the intersection of land, labor, dispossession and violence experienced by black South Africans during apartheid and even today. Can you just briefly give us some insights into the inspiration for the book? You mentioned a 1954 letter and an interaction with a farm worker. Um, yes, thanks for that question. I, I usually say that the, the book, you know, chose me. Uh, it made a demand. Uh, and this demand, I would say, starts when I was doing my master's in development economics, uh, looking at um, decent work in agriculture and how they and um, uh, the leadership of uh, Professor Webster. I was an intern then, you know. So when I was doing interviews on farms in Gauteng, I met one of my interlocutors, which I mentioned as uh, Mamwini, which is a, is a pseudonym. And in meeting Mamwini, um, you know, she had asked, um, what is it that brought me to the farm? I tried explaining the research, what I was doing, I'm looking at decent work. And she says, no, I mean, uh, you know, uh, what uh, ensured that we meet at this time of our lives, which was a very difficult and a profound um, a question, which I, I, I didn't have an answer to at that time. And a few days later, she called me, you know, that she was assaulted by uh, her boss, uh, one of uh, the owners of this farm that she was working in. And then we went, uh, I requested for assistance because I was a student then, asked uh, Professor Webster to accompany me and a trade unionist. And then the trade unionist, as we were driving to the farm, she kept on telling us stories of around, um, you know, the conditions most farm workers face, and even in that region. That in one of the places there in Jamistin, there was a farm where workers went on a strike, and as a form of punishment, uh, the farmer made them pick up heavy rocks, you know. And so this was um, a labor dispute, but the way uh, punishment is used, because she kept on telling us about punishment whenever there's a labor dispute. And so we got to the farm. We couldn't um, get assistance per se, because even when we opened the case, no one wanted to come forward as a witness, you know. And a few years later, I went uh, to pursue a PhD. When I was doing my PhD, I was always, you know, uh, troubled by what was happening or what I was told um, a few years back and what happened to Mamwi, you know. So um, I thought, okay, let me use an ethnographic method to get a job in this farm and understand what's happening um, uh, through my own eyes, you know. And I thought I'm doing some groundbreaking work because I'd be the first one to do this. But uh, that didn't happen. The farmer didn't give me, uh, uh, the farmer promised the job, but when I went back, uh, said, sorry, we can't uh, take you in anymore. So I had to find another method, you know. So I went back to mom, we need to let her know that I can't come to the farm and work on the farm anymore, you know. And she said, no, in order for your project to be successful, you have to study me. And in studying me, you learn a lot about yourself and you also have to see me as your mother. And in seeing me as your mother, you'll be seeing yourself. It's a lot of things that she was saying about seeing, you know, how one sees a problem and how one sees oneself. So at PhD level, I wrote about this, questions of ethics, what does it mean to study our community? But in 2012 as well, when we were looking at agriculture and writing, Professor Luli Kanisik Kalinikos had mentioned Bethel to me, you know, that there was a potato boycott that happened in 1959. And it was one big resistance that happened in South Africa. So when Mam Wini told me that I have to study her, I didn't have methods of studying her. Then I then went to the archives, you know, and then going to the archives that was around 2017. I thought, okay, let me look at Bethal, because I was told uh, by Professor Kalinikos about Bethal. And then looking at Bethal, I didn't know how to go through the archives. I had, I'm not trained in, yeah. in, in understanding, you know, what is it that you do once you have with this information. So they gave me boxes, and then I opened this box. And from this box, there's a letter. It is a great opportunity to write to you these few lines. And it is written by someone who's been transferred from one prison now working in Bethal. 
complaining how terrible the conditions are, how um, you know uh, they they get shambogged, uh, they get they, they are given rotten meat, you know, and sometimes they are not um, allowed to have food. And I thought, okay, there's some linkages, you know. And I wrote a bit of an essay in my PhD then on Bethal. Mm. But I thought it's much better if I dedicate some time writing, you know, about Bethal. And in writing about Bethal, then I was able to connect this question of land, labor, and much more so uh, home. This book then shows these linkages, you know, between what it means to work on a South African farm and much more so uh, how a farm is seen because a farm is, is thought of as a, you know, like a household. The farmer is seen as the father and the farm workers are the children, you know. And because of this relationship of a father and a child, sometimes the farmer uses violence to discipline workers. And this is seen as a paternal duty, uh, a father disciplining their children. And I thought there's a lot of violence that happens, but what is the meaning of, of this violence? And I think uh, I want to share a bit more of what is this meaning of this violence and what it means on South African farms. Now, can you just tell us how the potato became a symbol for justice in Bethel in 59? You mentioned it. Um, for farm workers who were killed and violated. Bethel, right, goes through various waves of, uh, of reporting. So... In 1947, when the Petty of scheme uh, drew uh, the, uh, the native uh, uh, commissioner, P.J. De Piers, in the Fort Speck uh, region, piloted the idea of arresting people who did not have uh, passes to go serve their sentences in farms. Reverend Michael Scott goes uh, to farms in Bethal to look at compound labor. That's 1947. And he discovers what he says is far worse than slavery. People uh, being supervised by boss boys who are carrying shambles and whips and whipping those who are slow. And then because of this, uh, 1952, Drum magazine drew Henry Nomad, who uses the pseudonym Mr. Drum. Following what uh, Michael Scott had covered, he goes again to Bethel in 1952. And he still finds the same thing. You know, but he discovers that actually some of the people who end up working in Bethal have been duped to work in Bethal. And the key challenge about Bethal that I show is that the Eastern Transvaal was far away from the reserve centers where they could attain cheap labor. Mm -hmm. So they had to use methods of mining, having compounds in, in the farms, and um, even using prison labor, you know. And so when Henry Ngumalo goes 1952, he finds that it's far worse than what was discovered in 1947, that now workers were stripped off of their clothes, given uh, potato sacks to wear, you know. And the potato sack um, also becomes um, a, a dish where they, uh, you know, collect their food with. And so this is where my idea of the eye, seeing, uh, drawing from what Mamwini has already told me about the act of seeing, which is what organizes the book. How do you see these struggles of the workers which you have not seen with your own mm -hmm. eyes, you know? So the first one, you can imagine someone wearing sex um, uh, that actually when looking from afar, you could see the sack but not the person and you would think it's a potato sack, you know? So that's the first uh, part. And then with this 1952 uh, drum exposure that's done uh, by Henry Nomad, he also shows that the, it was already in 1922 revealed that in Bethal uh, some farm was arrested uh, for tying up a worker to a tree, you know, shambling them when they were asking uh, water, giving them hot uh, water to drink. And so this was the violence in Bethal, you know, um, uh, quite continuous. And then so I thought, okay, with all this that was happening, you know, in the media, 1954, this letter comes in, showing two years later after the drum exposure, because it was a, a media brouhaha, you know, nothing has changed. And then 1959, through uh, uh, Cornelius, a worker gets killed, you know, 
And because of that, that speeds up the process. Uh, on the 31st of May, 1959, uh, Robert Resha, in one of the conferences of the ANC, calls for the boycott of potatoes uh, as a boycott of the brutality that happens on South African farms. So then, this then brings us to the potato. Because now, uh, this boycott was saying, we are not going to consume potatoes that come from the Eastern Transvaal. And by saying we are not going to consume potatoes that come from the Eastern Transvaal, the reason why, uh, the Eastern Transvaal, they kill workers, bury them in clandestine activities, and then plant potatoes. And now the potatoes have come back looking like humans. And that's the title, These Potatoes Look Like Humans, because this is what one of uh, the workers who gets interviewed in 2008 says, that we stopped eating the potato because they look like humans. So the potato then, I say, uh, using the, this you know, symbol of the eye that I'm using, it's as if the potato was looking deep from the ground and seeing what was happening. And then now uh, revealing it uh, through taking its, uh, the shape of a human, you know. And in so doing, this potato, because if you think of the morphology of the potato, and you would see even the activist like Francis Bard would say that we used a potato uh, and, and, and pointed in sports and say, this is where the blood of your children is. You do not eat the potato. Francis Bart was likely pointing to the eyes of the potato because uh, the potato has eyes, you know, where new uh, potatoes uh, sprout. So this eye of the potato then was said, if you look at this potato now, the potato looks like a human because it has eyes, it has a face, you know. So if you eat a potato, you're eating a human being. You're eating all those, you know, who have been violated in, in, in the Eastern Transvaal or in South African farms. So then this then, you know, potato becoming a symbol of uh, justice or demanding justice on behalf of the dead. It's like a spectre haunting, you know, uh, all of the farmers who were involved in these clandestine activities, haunting, you know, all these uh, moments that I've um, mentioned that, you know, raises a brouhaha, but it dies down, you know, because now people are not consuming potatoes. And there are also pictures in warehouses where, uh, you know, the massive number of potatoes are rotting because mm -hmm. people are not consuming them. So it brought a spotlight on those who died on South African farms. And it was a demand, you know, a demand for the dead by the living. So that's why I, I speak of, of, of it as, you know, a symbol of, of justice and how the symbol of justice was used, you know, to make those who can't see Remember that when you're looking at a potato, you're also looking at those who have died. Now you also explain the relationship between black people and the land and how dispossession destroys that link. And you coined the term ontological nowhereness in your book. Can you just tell us what that term means? Ontological nowhereness. Um, while I was uh, reading um, Saul Blachi, you know, in his retelling of how the 19... The Dead in Land Act made uh, black people pariahs in the land of their own, you know. He says, um, as soon as the 1913 Land Act was passed, uh, many thought that, you know, they'd find a space where they'd get a piece of land, you know. And they were wandering uh, to nowhere. And this wandering um, to nowhere because they could not find a space anymore because there was a demand that you have to work the land with your cattle. And it was a protest of working this land with one's uh, cattle, you know. And so in looking at that, I thought, okay, what, what is this meaning of land, you know? Blatty then writes a story about how when some of uh, a family called uh, the Khobadi family, when they were dragging from the free state, uh, their baby dies. And now they are faced with a question, where will we bury this child? And they bury the child at night and they steal a grave. And that act of stealing a grave shows us that already, you know, they had no space where they belonged. They were truly pariahs. But this nowhereness, you know, means that their entire being was, you know, um, a, a, a dispossessed because they have a relationship with the land. And this relationship, I write through the book, begins with the birth of a child, you know. The birth of a child, when a child is born, they drop the umbilical cord. They, uh, many families bury that umbilical cord under a tree. 
And once that person passes away, they use one of the branches of the tree to fetch the spirit of that person. That is the link, you know. So when I say ontological knowingness, firstly, I borrow uh, from metaphysics, ontology, which is a branch of philosophy concerned about being. And I say black people's being in this way has always been linked to the land. And what this possession does, it disturbs that. Now you have to steal a grave, you know, to bury your own. And imagine uh, what happens because you can't even go back to that, to that grave, you know, because you don't belong in that space. So it's about um, not having a space where one belongs, um, where, um, you know, ontologically as a being, you have nowhere to go. And this ontological nowhereness, you can even see it in the petty offender scheme because what the petty offender scheme does it deals on the fact that many of the black people who are in the cities you know some of them do not have um, uh, the passes to be there and so they do not belong there mm. and when the farmers were complaining about not having uh, cheap labor they they said we'll use this ontological knowingness you know of black people to send them uh, to the farm. So that's what I, I mean, you know, not having a, a space where one belongs, uh, where one's being has been removed, you know, and there's no um, linkage with, with that being. Now you also write about the anxieties felt by the white um, farm owners for the appropriation of the land. What were these anxieties? It is precisely this ontological knowingness. Because this ontological knowingness, I, I'm arguing that it haunted not just the white um, farmers, but the white society as a whole, which always saw the black people as dangerous through the idea of a suar khefar, you know. Because um, once one has no home, uh, there are uh, moments where I'm saying these eyes are searching for a home. So once one has no home, they are seen as, you know, dangerous beings because um, they are searching for a home. But when I write in the book, I say, during this period, you know, we see a tyranny of a minority and a majority trying to fight this tyranny, you know, and this majority said to be criminals. Mm -hmm. And how are they said to be criminals? Because they do not have pass, they end up on the farms. But when we look at the farm, this is where it becomes interesting. And I say, okay, when you look at the farm, that's where you see this question of home being alive. Because the farm, as I've said, is thought of uh, as a family unit. Uh, the farmer will have their house. Uh, those um, who are labor tenants will also have their houses there. But now the petty offender scheme, what it does, it brings in someone who's an outsider to this relationship a criminal. And so to the farmer, uh, this anxiety, you know, is an anxiety of knowing that these are beings, you know, who also see this piece of land as their home. And once in a while I have to use violence. And in using violence, and I say this violence reveals an anxiety. And this anxiety, you know, we can see it in two ways, revealing and concealing. Revealing the fact that they know that, um, you know, uh, they can't constantly use uh, violence to keep the workers docile. Concealing that they are anxious about the future. So the question becomes, uh, when we look at Bethan, why go as far as killing workers if you're complaining about shortage of labor? And I say, this is, um, you can only see it through the question of land. Because when the farmers were now bringing in criminals, some of these um, uh, so-called criminals or the petty offenders also identified this place as their home because uh, uh, if you read the book, you'll see that P.J. Dibes also tells uh, those who are arrested that the farm is their national factory. Mm -hmm. And if they do not go work on the farms, they'll be punished by their ancestors as if, you know, the farm is, their, is the home of their ancestors. So as soon as people identified this place as their home, that created an anxiety mm -hmm. to the farmer as a settler. And this anxiety is not just an anxiety that's felt uh, by the farm. I'm saying it's an anxiety that's felt by a white society that has dispossessed the majority, you know. And this anxiety is related to the future, that in future, they too might lose the graves of their parents, you know. So that's what I'm, I'm, I mean by this um, 
a question of anxiety when I look at the farmers. You also visited farms in Bethel and you spoke with labor tenants. What did you take away from that visit? I think uh, visiting Bethel builds on a tradition because I was looking at how um, there were people who were visiting Bethel in different uh, times, 1947, Reverend Scott, and then Ruth um, uh, first also writes an article, uh, 1952, um, um, Henry Numalo goes uh, and works as a, as, a, um, as a farm worker and through the assistant of Jagen uh, Schaderberg. And then in 1958, Drum Magazine visits Bethal again. And you will see that the picture that I'm using in the cover of the book is taken in 1958 by Peter Makuban. So there were moments when Bethal is visited. And in 2005, Jagen Schaderberg with Styles Litwaba, they visit Bethal again. And so I thought, okay, there were moments where people visit Bethal, you know. How about I also go visit Bethal and see with my own eyes what Bethal looks like and use the same style of writing that they used about Bethal. And this is what I do in Chapter 6, Bethal Today, which is a title that I borrow from Henry Numalo's um, uh, Bethal Today of 1952. So in going to the farms in Bethal, I, I, you know, I was working with, a theory at first, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are linked to the land um, as uh, a way that links us around the question of the future, around um, how we'll be returned to this land, you know, as a place of our ancestors, as a home. That was only theoretical, you know, so I had to go and have conversations with uh, people. And I looked at uh, certain farms that were in the news uh, articles in the 50s, and then I went to those farms. And I found a few labor tenants that still reside there. And you will see that um, uh, I also indicate that uh, farming is no longer a major activity in those farms. It's, it's moved towards coal. You know, potato farming is no longer that big in, in Bethal. So these labor tenants um, relate to me how they are also holding on uh, to the land and how they are being pushed out of the land by the farmer. And I thought, hmm, interesting. Let me inquire a bit further what do they mean by this. And they were to say that they are trying to push us out so that we do not have a claim to this land, confirming what I was already working with. And we are not going anywhere because they would also point at the graves of their parents and said our parents worked here in this farm. And while I was going there, I was also trying to understand if they still remember about the boycott and what these farms mean. Some of them would remember and say their parents worked on the farms around that time, you know. But it raised issues of, um, you know, labor tenancy. And it raised issues about um, uh, the extension of, uh, of, of, of security um, tenure, Esther. Because it says that once you've been on the farm for 10 years, you know, you belong there. But many of them would say the farmer kicks us out because we don't have a title deed. There's no law that protects us. And I write that the farmer on the farm is the law. And going against the farmer, in most cases, you know, it means you are met with violence. And one of the ways of using this violence is to actually kick people out the farm, you know. And this is a contestation I'm arguing. And this is the contestation I'm writing about, a, contest a contestation about the future of the land, you know. Who belongs in this land, you know. Who gets a right to say this is a home which is what uh, most of the farmers are anxious about, you know, and that's why uh, you'd see that um, uh, as soon as we transition, you know, that when the democratic transition happened, there were a number of, um, you know, uh, labor tenants who were kicked out of the farms. That on its own shows us that, you know, the farmers were already anticipating a contestation around ownership. Lastly, Mbuso, do you think since democracy we've made progress on land injustices and what more can we do? So what I'm, I'm saying in the book is that the return of you know, the demand for land in South Africa reflects that South Africa is haunted. And this perhaps you can start by saying it's a spiritual haunting 
And because it's a spiritual haunting, it reflects, you know, that there are also those who are not resting at peace um, in, in this uh, land, you know. You can imagine as far as blood, people stealing graves. The three pillars of land in South Africa, restitution, um, reform, and um, tenure, have been, uh, you know, so slow. Uh, because if we can even look at uh, ownership, you know, agricultural ownership, 72% uh, is still uh, white owned, 15%, uh, these are statistics coming, I think, 2017, 15% is colored, 5% Indian, 4% uh, African. So this is like, you know, and then the other uh, just individuals who, who are not mentioned by race. So this shows us, you know, the, con the concentration of, of land, you know, in a few hands. But I, I think uh, when we, we, we look at the, the challenges, you know, that is just at the level of the material, the statistics showing us, you know. But um, there are other ways which we see how dispossession continues today, you know, how the failure to address the issues of this land question still continue. And I think when I was relaying the story of, of Chapter 6, Bethel today, it shows us this continuity in the present, you know, how people are also being dispossessed, because once you are moved, you're losing your, uh, the, the graves of your ancestors. That's what they're saying. That's why they're holding on. So it's been quite um, a, a challenge, you know. And because the, the land question is a multifaceted issue, you know, and I'm saying it goes just beyond the material that we need to own land uh, so that we can plant it land is also a home it becomes quite challenging you know to come up with ways to deal with this and i think um, uh, for me the failure to imagine land beyond just the material is the one that limits how you know uh, intervention occurs because once you say okay we have esther at least we have sorted out the issue of 10 but you realize that actually you have not dealt with uh, how the farmer perceives themselves as the law and how at any point they can, uh, workers can be kicked out of, of that land. So what, what needs to be done, you know, uh, the first uh, point is to say there's a lot of work that's been produced and one of those is, is these potatoes look like humans, you know, is that we go through um, uh, 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 seeing, you know, uh, through different eyes what the land means rather than reducing it uh, to just a, a material uh, thing, you know, that could, uh, once we have solved the problem of ownership, uh, we have so many people owning the land, then we are okay. No, uh, there are also other um, issues that uh, uh, lay uh, uncovered around the land. And I think what I'm saying uh, right at the end, you know, as, as when we still have vast hectares of land, laborers, and people looking at those conditions as home, Bethal still remains present. So that's what I'm, I'm saying in the book. And that's why I say the present is a haunted present because a lot of uh, uh, people are, are losing, you know, uh, their um, uh, uh, ancestral graves. They're losing a place that they call home, a place where they'll be returned to. So when we think of, you know, uh, addressing the issues, we have to be thinking of these experiences, you know, and what it means to be dispossessed even in the present. So it's not just the pillars that look at the past, but also linking it uh, to what's happening in, in the present. So it's a long, uh, a long uh, way of thinking, and a number of minds have applied uh, themselves to this uh, problem. And I think what I'm doing is to offer a minor contribution, you know, uh, while uh, showing that, you know, there's also been a limited way in how we think of, of this uh, a problem of land in South Africa. That was author Busun Kosi speaking with Policy about his book, These Potatoes Look Like Humans, The Contested Future of Land, Home and Death in South Africa.